Welcome to the uh, uh, le our, our first lecture of opportunity uh, virtually um, on behalf of the uh, electives department and the Arctic Studies group. Uh, we want to welcome you and, and thank you for taking the time uh, out of your busy schedules uh, to, to join us here uh, here this afternoon or, or for, from wherever you are. Um, I'd like to first thank uh, each of you for joining us and, and also uh, our, our incredible team here at the Naval War College who, who made this event possible, uh, our electives department, uh, our audio vi visual team, our public affairs office, our events department. Uh, so thank, thanks to each and every one of you for, for making this possible. Um, this, this afternoon's lecture, will uh, we, we're so fortunate to uh, be joined by Dr. Amory Brady, uh, who will discuss uh, China's military interests in the Arctic. Uh, she'll speak for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll roll right into discussion uh, for about 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so I, you know, I, I'll ask that um, at, right now, just as a reminder to, to um, mute your, your mics uh, if you can. And, um, and, during the, and, and if you have any questions during the uh, question and answer period, we'll, we'll get to those. Um, but if you can input those in the chat, function uh, of your Zoom, uh, that'd, be, that'd be great. And then we'll uh, compile all those questions at the end and we'll go ahead and pose those, I'll go ahead and pose those questions uh, to Dr. Brady uh, so, so we can have a discussion. Uh, Dr. Brady, as, as many of you know, she's a specialist in, in Chinese politics and polar politics, New Zealand politics, uh, New Zealand foreign policy. She's, she's fluent in Chinese Mandarin. Uh, she's the founder and, and executive director uh, for the Polar Journal. Uh, she has published uh, 10 books and over 40 scholarly articles, including uh, her, her 2017 book uh, on China as a, a polar, uh, polar great power, uh, which is the basis of her talk today. Uh, and coming live all the way from New Zealand, which is 16 hours uh, difference, time difference, is uh, Dr. Amory Brady. Uh, over to you. Thank you again and uh, look forward to your talk. Tenakota katoa. Greetings, everybody. Really um, wonderful to be able to speak to you today. Uh, Walter and I have been in discussion um, about um, coming to speak uh, to you, your university for a couple of years now. And um, this is um, a great way to, to do so. And I, and I hope in future I'll have a chance to come and um, <clears throat> meet more of you in person because I think we can I, th I think you know there's only so there's I, I can give a talk but there's there's a lot more can be drawn out from the questions and answers so I am going to um, try and meet the huge challenge of, sort of summarizing some of the findings in my book uh, China as a polar great power which came out in 2017 um, published by Cambridge University Press and the Woodrow Wilson Center which I'm a, I'm a global fellow with them and I um, wrote up the book when I was there and actually, while I was there, I pointed out to the Wilson Centre that they were doing a whole lot of Arctic and Antarctic activities and they should be ahead of everybody and um, set up what I suggested called the Polar Initiative. And they have indeed done that. And I see they're doing a lot of, um, they are in fact doing a lot of groundbreaking work in the US and raising issues about the importance of the polar regions for US um, security as well as the security interests of other countries. Because I think, um, as I observed when I was in Washington, living in Washington, D.C., that um, the U.S. and its partners have been distracted by um, other regions of the world and haven't, um, perhaps the focus hasn't been on the strategic importance of the Arctic and Antarctic. Or perhaps there was just thought that, you know, it was done and dusted and the Antarctic Treaty had, the, the Antarctic region had been, an area where there was a lot of um, uh, diplomatic engagement in the 1980s because of the Cramera negotiations. That was the uh, minerals, uh, a, a treaty that would have permitted um, minerals exploitation that was passed, but then not ratified. And then the environmental protocol was passed. So some of the leading scholars on international uh, polar law in the, in the US um, said to me, you know, it's, there's, there's nothing going on there. But what I, I, I found, uh, and similarly in the Arctic, it was believed, you know, at the end of the Cold War, then 
um, it's really is a sort of a bit of a backwater and then the US has already got its um, security needs sorted out there and Russia and China are the main, Russia and the US are the main players. But what I found in my research in the Chinese sources is very different positions on the Antarctic and very, and positions on the Arctic that had never been made public. So, um, and so, and there's always, you know, I'm a, also, some of my early research is on the CCP, um, what propaganda system, propaganda is not a negative word for the CCP or other Marxist Leninist countries, Xuanchan is the Chinese word. Um, and so we could call it management of the public sphere, you know, the the what it, because it's very wide where it goes. So it's always important to know about um, Chinese government messaging that there's a two track, at least a two track. You know, what foreigners are supposed to know and what's directed at the Chinese public, and then of course the internal discussion. So on the Arctic um, and the Antarctic, on any, and the public statements on that were. Um, a, uh, well, a very limited part of China's intentions there. So the overall theme that I have um, uh, highlighted for my talk is China's military interests in the, Ant in the Arctic. And I draw your attention to a paper that I published with China Brief last year, it feels like a century ago. I bet you will all feel the same. I feel like when I looked at it, was, was that really December 2019? It feels like a decade ago. Um, and that was called Facing Up to China's Military Interests in the Arctic. It's not too long, so you're all busy people. You can read that and you can read it for free. So just go to James, the Jamestown website and look up China Brief and then go into the archives and you'll find it under December 2019. And I also recommend that you go to the McDonald Laurier Institute. They also asked me to do something on the Arctic, China's policies in the Arctic, um, from the point of view of Canada's interests. And I think Canada's interests may not be too far. Well, there are some differences, of course, on, um, uh, for example, the views on uh, international shipping in the Arctic. But anyway, there'll be something interesting there for you. So if you just Google my name and McDonald Laurier Institute Arctic, you should find that paper. And that was released about the same time. So um, Walter's got some slides that I'm going to go through. So what I'll do is I'll run through um, the sort of background, I think, that's important to understand China's intentions in the Arctic and as well as the Antarctic, because I know that many of you who might be listening in today, you're Arctic specialists and you think, well, that's what I'm interested in. But China uniquely, um, uh, which is why I called my book, uh, China is a polar great power, uh, China, uh, yeah, China is a polar great power. They coined this term polar great power. And it's part of their, um, their level of ambition that they use this term because there are, of course, the actual polar great power is the US and Russia because, and, and you've got different capacities there. I mean, Russia's, well, it, you know, there's different measures of power. But China um, is part of that, which really reflects their desire to uh, re, literally to reorient the global order, uh, um, is, was, is looking um, at these areas of um, of uh, where there's internet international spaces where China can access and build on its power, and the Arctic and Antarctic are part of that. And they studied uh, Chinese scholars were given the task of studying various Arctic and Antarctic powers, and looking at their capacities, looking at their policies, the history, what worked for them, or, or, you know, a whole lot of due diligence and learning from that and adapting that. And the cover of my book is this um, map, um, the vertical map, world map, which came out, people might remember in 2014, there was a, quite a lot of media attention about China's new um, national map that had um, the nine dash line on it. I've got a picture of it coming up further along. And But what people didn't talk about was in this package of maps published by Hunan Chulban Shou, Hunan Publishers, was the vertical world map. And this map is done by a really brilliant um, geographer in Wuhan, who I went to interview, who advised the PLA um, that their maps um, for their missile positioning was wrong, that they could save um, a little bit of um, missile power if they went uh, via the Arctic and used different maps. And his maps have been used by uh, the PLA and the China Ocean administration and now have and they're they are part I mean maps are always political aren't they so if we go to the next slide they're part of a literal reorienting um, 
um, from from the CCP's perspective, a very ambitious global perspective. You know what Xi Jinping's now calling the new order, uh, new era. Sorry, Xi Shidai. So you know, people in the in the United States and North America and in Europe, you're you're used to the Atlantic centred uh, vision of the world. And we're here in New Zealand and Australia and Oceania and China, we've we're being used to seeing the world as a as a Pacific centered world. And in China's maps of the world, there is little New Zealand as the center of their um, their vision. If you ever watch CCTV seven o'clock news, we we're we pro we're quite prominent there. But if you go to the next map, you'll see our next page, we'll see a China centered world. And you see the prominence of Antarctica here, like a white peacock, and the Arctic Ocean appears like a like a. In Chinese, the word for Mediterranean is is a middle ocean, uh, a central ocean, Zhongjiahai, and so the Arctic here is um, you can you can see uh, the it as a in, in a very different perspective, perhaps from where you're used to seeing it on global maps. And in China's imaginary of the world, um, the U.S. is its uh, you know, back backdoor neighbor, and um, and you also China's vision of the world is is um, was uh, on this map is very influenced by the founding father of modern geopolitics, um, Mackinder, and more on him in a moment. Uh, and Mackinder, I'm I'm sure quite a few of you will be familiar with Harold Mackinder because um, well I hope you are because. Um, <laughs> Because his ideas are, you know, really interesting and important if you're trying to understand China today. But they were very influential in geopolitical thinking of um, in the Cold War and in after World War One. He was trying to work out. He wrote his book after World War One. He was trying to understand why the countries of Europe had been constantly going to war for hundreds of years. And one of the one of the breakthroughs in his thinking was he came up with this idea. He did a whole lot of maps that were different from the traditional ones that people were used to doing. And he came up with this idea of the world island. So you see here in China's um, vertical uh, map, which is now one of the official maps of China, this world island. So you could take a benevolent view and see, see how interconnected we all are in this vision. And you can see how the oceans connect us. Um, and you can see that China is at the center of this um, order. And of course, the Chinese, the word for China is Zhongguo, the Middle Kingdom. Um, so there, this is a highly political map and it is an ambitious map. Um, and another feature of the map is, as I said, the prominence of the ocean. So when Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, immediately polar policies and the maritime strategy became um, much more important than it had been. And he's got a history um, more so than any le um, leaders in um, awareness and interest in these um, issues. Uh, I'll just take a bit of a, 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 an aside actually, because I think it's quite interesting detail that um, his first ever um, role was in, um, he was the, um, his first ever job after leaving Tsinghua University, he was a cultural revolution, I mean he was sent down to the countryside when he was about 11, so he finished his high school at um, what you'd call um, middle school and um, then spent quite a few years in the countryside, but got to go to university in the early 70s. Imagine going to engineering school when you only had um, middle school education. It was a big struggle, but back in those days, they, you know, they spent more time doing labor, literally digging trenches and things like that than studying engineering and other subjects. And that's where his, um, must have been very hard, and that's where his saying about to, uh, which is his foreign policy dictum um, about be proactive comes from that time. Anyway, so he, he, because of who his father was, a senior PLA general, he got a job straight out of after university, not as an engineer, but as the personal secretary to Gong Biao, who was then the Minister of Defence. And uh, Gong Biao was the leader when a fatal decision was made to buy some redundant um, submarines from France. Redundant, why? Because they were too noisy for the job, which was to try and get under the Arctic ice and could get a second strike deterrent for China. 
So Gumbia lost his job because of that, probably also because of factional issues. And also um, she was uh, Gumbia's personal secretary at the time when China sent its first Antarctic expedition. And they, at that stage, they had to use the People's Liberation Army Navy to do so. And then they were hopeless. They, their, their vessels broke down. One of them broke down in the South China Sea. And um, the scientists tell me that when they were built, the terribly uh, difficult labor of building a base uh, by hand, they had about 300 People's Liberation Army Navy soldiers so standing at, at, at arms with them, my hands up like a, with, with weapons there, as if the penguins were going to attack them uh, and not lending a hand. And um, so he was there in those early days when they saw the redundancy of their own technology, and yet they were well aware, as I document in my book, of the strategic importance of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, both um, for them, their own potential and what they are aspiring to do in the future, which is to become one of the dominant powers, and that's very clear in the literature of the CCP. Um, but also in you know what we call the strategic triangle. I'm just writing a new paper on this at the moment. Um, the C the CCP the strategic triangle from the CCP's point of view was it's not like a a temporary thing. It's, a, it's perennial, the balance of power between Russia and China and the US, and China just has to choose sides. So what's important to Russia and the US must then be important to China, um, because whatever's made the Russia and China, the US powerful um, may well be important to China. Um, so as I said, Xi Jinping had personal experience at a time when China didn't get the, their polar policies right, and he built on the work that had been done, particularly in the whole era, um, where there'd been an increase and in, very significant increase in budget in polar activities. And it, um, but it, it really went into overdrive on Xi, on Xi Jinping. So I, th I think that's significant because it's, it's always important to understand, you know, the role of the leadership and why uh, you know, things are taking off a bit more. So further on to the next slide, I wanna to talk to you a little bit of the framing that is behind China's thinking too. So the map, there's on the right, there's that picture of uh, the nine dash line uh, map, the Chinese map of China with a nine dash line that came out of the package with the, um, that new vertical map. But the one on the left here is uh, one of the rare visual images of the island chains, all three of the island chains. Now, people in the media, um, when they talk about the island chains these days, they tend to uh, lump them with China. But of course, the strategy, the, the mindset of it the, um, comes from the United States and the, the, the era of John Foster Dulles. And the first and second island chains are literal, but the third island chain, chain, chain is metaphorical, going from the Aleutians to Hawaii, all the way down to New Zealand and as far as Antarctica. And, you know, sometimes there's a, people talk about the advantages of authoritarianism, you know, that if they want to say all cars off the street of Beijing before the apex summit, they can do it. Um, whereas a democracy needs to negotiate that. Um, but there's disadvantages in authoritarian societies too. It's pretty hard to change. It's harder than it is, even harder than it is for our countries to change course on a strategy and change course on a mindset. So after the Mao era, um, there was a big rethink on China's maritime strategy and a real strong criticism of it because it had been set very much by the Soviet view. And the Soviet view believed that if we go to the next slide, this guy who you should all be familiar with, Alfred Mahan, he was um, an, an imperialist and his thinking on the um, on, on maritime uh, doctrine uh, was not, well, not useful for, um, for China or, or for Russia. But in the early 80s, um, China, even when they didn't have the capacity to do anything about it, was looking to Mahan as the way forward and rejecting the Soviet naval doctrine, which had, in, had said that China should focus on its land-based defense and, and when it comes to maritime melee, uh, have enough resources to protect its uh, own near seas. So of course, Alfred Mahan famously, or Mahan, I'm, 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 I'm happy to be corrected if I'm mispronouncing him according to the way you all do in the US. Um, 
he looked he compared the rise and and the contested power between the the united kingdom or great britain and france and he looked he, he wrote about well what does a rising power need to do if they want to be become dominant in, in the international system and here are some of the um, key points from um, alfred mahan's thinking um, and china um, is um, doing every single one of them to to the nth degree so going back to what i was saying about the the um the island chains is that um i i wonder now and i'll be you know military specialists um will be able to debate this um you know in the era when when for example my country's just suffered a series of really serious cyber attacks is a kinetic warfare the most important thing these days um, you know, and political warfare is incredibly damaging um, also to, to all our countries. So I wonder if China's massive investment in hardware, is, which was very much in focus on the Mahanian doctrines because of this um, responding to the island chain strategy, if, um, you know, that is a, um, you know, reflective of how things were in the 80s and what was important in the 80s for example important to get an aircraft carrier and so on but regardless that is the trajectory that they're following and that's why uh, and, and that drives so much of their thinking so if we move on here's another important influence is um, on the next slide walter is mckinder harold mckinder so here you see his map of um, the world island, or one of his maps. And he had the famous saying, who rules East Europe commands the heartland, who rules the heartland commands the world island, who rules the world island commands the world. And the heartland for China is a different heartland than it was for Makinda. But this, this again is a very important strand in the strategic thinking in China um, for its vision for the Arctic and Antarctic and, the, and for the, um, the, uh, the maritime domain. And when I was doing my interviews in China, I asked um, Chol, uh, some of the polar strategists, like, how come you have to take another uh, foreign uh, thinker again to guide your strategy? I mean, can't you come up with a, a, an indigenous approach? It surprised me because they're so nationalistic usually. And they said to me, Zio Mahan, there's only Mahan. You know, Mahan is the, um, He's, his his uh, analysis is was was really important and and, and for for them um, and for and McKin add, add on to that Mackinder and of course Dallas and the and all the thinkers behind Dallas of the island chain. So if we keep going, please, onto the next slide. So yeah, so I talked about the island chains, and then of course the hub and spoke defence pact. So China, uh, the vision from look the way the world looks from China is it's facing those containment strategies that were set up um, at the uh, beginning of the Korean War, um, all the series of military agreements that the US has um, and, or had in the case of um, ANZUS. And then, um, you know, that's only been reinforced by um, moves to more um, alignment um, uh, between in the Indo-Pacific Command. And also from Dallas came this idea of peaceful evolution, which probably most people in the West have forgotten about, but which is used as the idea that more exposure, that the, one of the ways in which the, the Western democracies could, could undermine co the communist state was to engage as much as possible and expose the citizenry, citizenry to um, Western liberal ideas, for example, and culture, and that would steadily change and transform those societies. Um, and uh, it, this phrase, peaceful evolution, comes up a lot in the CCP internal discussions, and they talk about hostile foreign forces uh, repeatedly. Um, so that is a, uh, that's a, another um, part of China's vision of why they need to um, to go beyond defend themselves, but create to uh, to to break out of these um, contain the containment strategy and the um, and the island chains, which was uh, keeping China weak. And what they want to be is uh, a rich country with a strong military, and that's a fu chang is the saying in Chinese. So if we move on to the next slide.
So another, another obsession in the Chinese leadership is the fear of the choke points. So around about seven, between 70 and 80% of China's trade goes through the state of Strait of Malacca. I mean, most 75% of New Zealand's trade uh, is going up there as well. Um, but we don't have the resources that China has um, to do anything uh, to, to try and to force any change. But these obsessions um, um, have led to um, looking for alternatives to that. And the Belt Road Initiative is very much a response to that, to find alternatives to the fear that China has in a time of conflict that they could, their trade routes could be blockaded. So that brings us closer to talking about the Arctic and the role that the Arctic has in China's security. So these, this is just giving you the backdrop to thinking about what's behind China's big investment in infrastructure in the Arctic and Antarctic and um, efforts to engage with governments there. So on to the next slide. So this, these three um, key uh, interests, strategic interests identified, comes out of um, research that um, chi Chinese language uh, internal documents that I was able to have access to. I didn't just make them up. Um, this is, these are um, uh, citations that, um, and they are in that order. So the top priority is um, security, both traditional and non-traditional security. And you know this image on the right hand side, um, it appeared um, on the, the um, cover of People's Daily in uh, 2013, about October 2013, um, China was doing some saber rattling, and they said, you know, we, we've, our missiles um, can target 12 um, US cities crossing the Arctic. Uh, and that was a, a rare visual example, visual um, kind of some, some information to, to show uh, how strategically important the Arctic was in China's thinking about its uh, military security. So another priority is resources and resources in the broadest possible sense. So China um, from 2014 to 2016 had a big study of social scientists and scientists involved looking at what are the resources in the Arctic and Antarctic and what is the governance structure. So basically what's there and how can we access it? And you know, you might say, "Hey, um, the um, the Arctic is uh, sovereign territory." But from the Chinese perspective, even if the extended continental shelf um, claims were all agreed to, what they would amount to was sovereign rights, not sovereign territory. So there would still be things that China could access. And when it comes to Arctic resources, China will pay market prices um, for that. And you can see that they're, they're indeed doing so. But access is also a resource, access to being able to get to um, and, and utilize um, uh, opportunities in the Arctic and Antarctic is, is also an, a, um, a resource. For example, um, being able to do strategic science in the Arctic and Antarctic is important to China. So onto the third category is science and technology. And I'd really highlight Beidou, since our theme is military. So um, on, on to that more in a, in a minute, because I mean, you guys, there's a lot of you who are the military specialists. I, I, I don't want to be um, speak it's, you know, of um, Beidou and, and, and the role of that, but I'm just giving you an overview so it can lead into questions. So we can go on to the next um, slide, please. Yeah, so Beidou it is. Um, so China and Russia uh, both participated um, in uh, the rollout of uh, GPS, and they've got ground stations in their own countries of GPS. But at some point, um, they realized that they needed their own alternative global navigation system because of the military importance of um, GPS. In fact, I've spoken recently to a senior Russian Antarctic official who's very cross about how uh, they've got GPS stations in Russia and the US certainly wouldn't allow GLONASS stations in the US. And so China's ambitious foreign policy um, in the Xi era is uh, very much connected to the, 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 um, 
expansion of Beidol because, and, and it's connected into um, the Belt and Road Initiative too. There's a so-called digital Silk Road. So countries have signed Belt Road Initiative um, agreements with China. And of course, there's varying different degrees of what you've signed. In my country signed an agreement to talk about it, an MOA. Others have, in some, the conditions of some MOUs are different from other countries. But China's hope is that the countries who sign up to um, Belt and Road will have Beidou ground stations because that would obviously really help their accuracy. And they will. They also want countries to um, to take Huawei into their um, 5G as well as 3 and 4G as they already are, and people to take on Huawei phones because just as with GPS on our phones, that provides micro information to the um, the positioning the global um, satellite positioning. So uh, Beidou is very much in rivalry with um, the US GPS system. And as I wrote in a paper in um, the Australian, uh, I think two years ago now, there's a space race at the poles and uh, for Russia and China, as well as the US to have the state of the art <coughs> um, system. And China managed to get um, quite a way with the development of its um, program by emphasizing the scientific aspects of Beidou, which indeed there is. Um, but the military aspect, so they've got three ground stations in Australia, which I'd like to remind them of. New Zealand has none. Um, and there is no Pacific country that has any, unless um, the one, the big uh, satellite dish on Tongan embassy counts as a Beidou ground station. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, maybe someone can tell me. Um, but um, they are um, have it finding more resistance um, in these days to doing to to getting these ground stations, as um, people will have observed. So that's a really important part to China's interests in the Arctic and Antarctic. They have ground stations in Svalbard as they're allowed to, um, because they are used for scientific purposes. But as I was about to say, the military aspect to it was revealed in 2014. You know, in a, publicly revealed when. Um, PLA satellites were used to help rescue a Russian icebreaker that had been hired by a Australian scientific team who got stuck on the ice in Antarctica. And that was the first use of this um, satellite system for China when it was coordinated by the PLA. And the PLA is a very important actor. And I would say from my interviews, but actually the lead actor currently in China's expanding um, polar policies and, the, and activities in the Arctic and Antarctic. I'm nearly running out of time on my own um, schedule. So if we can go to the next um, slide, and then I'm going to try and um, try and give you time for the questions that I think will be really important. I've got lots of detail, but hopefully they'll be drawn out in the question. So the nuclear deterrence is very important to China. Obviously, they've been work, they don't have a large amount of missiles compared to the US and Russia. You will have in around 2,500, 2,700 uh, uh, nuclear missiles. China's is about 230 or so, um, from, from memory anyway, small number. Um, they say they won't, their policy is not first strike, but they want a second strike and to have, and then so it was early on identified for China, the value of having an Arctic, uh, a submarine stationed in the Arctic hidden under the ice. And like I said, they've been, you know, they actually as well before uh, Xi Jinping and uh, his time with Gung Biao, that this, um, there's been this agenda. Um, China has, um, Actually, ever since the USS Skate um, surfaced above the Arctic ice, uh, China, uh, Mao Zedong said to Khrushchev, we want one of those. And, this, and the Soviets said, well, you know, we've got you covered. And that was sort of, you add that to the list of the, the things that the Soviets didn't do right for the CCP, because the Soviet Union wouldn't share its nuclear submarine technology with them. So China, from that, according to the history of um, submarine uh, making in China, they started trying their own rudimentarily um, submarine program uh, starting with wooden submarines, apparently. And then I said they bought some redundant, uh, one, very expensive redundant ones, um, what became in the early 80s, which became the Shah class submarines. And um, 
and the purpose specific goal was to combat us maritime power and so they've been steadily building up their program. The latest news and about a week ago was that China and Russia are collaborating on making a, um, a submarine, which will be suitable for Arctic conditions. And that's a really, really interesting development to me because China and Russia's uh, interests in the Arctic don't necessarily align. Um, and it, it's a, uh, they have a strategic partnership, they call it, um, and there's quite conditional support. So another uh, interesting development was um, early this year, a Russian professor was um, arrested, allegedly for taking plans or information about how to, de to detect submarines under um, Arctic ice. He was heading over to one of the polar universities or polar focused universities in China um, with those plans. So I saw that as an indication that um, there are limits on Russia's cooperation um, with China uh, in, in the Arctic. It's not full hearted. And a Russian uh, military magazine uh, last year talked about the possibility of Russia providing port support for Chinese submarines in the Arctic and proposed a Russia-China air missile um, defense system for the Arctic. Of course, Russia has been very um, supportive of the um, Belt and Road Initiative in the Arctic and um, in order to open up the Northern Sea Route. So um, I, I, it's not the same as in the, 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 Europe, the relationship between the Soviet Union and China, um, which was, of course, always fractious um, behind the scenes and in the era when the CCP was simply a, a, a was founded by the Comintern and supported by the Soviet Union. It's always been a difficult relationship. I think now Russia doesn't want to see a dominant China, and yet they are helping China to a degree with this. Um, so if we move on, because I think we can talk more about this in questions. So China's been very active in um, trying to get in on the, at the table of every Arctic and Antarctic connected um, governance body. And they now do have what they call Huai Yuchan, the right to speak on Arctic affairs, which they didn't when they first applied to be a member of the, or a observer, sorry, of the Arctic Council in 2009. But now because of this, China Inc approach to engaging in the Arctic, on, on engaging on multiple platforms, multiple uh, societal, cultural, tourist, you name it, and also bilaterally with the different um, Arctic states, China is an accepted um, a stakeholder in Arctic affairs. Of course, it started about 10 years ago with using this phrase uh, that they were a near Arctic state, um, which is, um, well, it's obviously very controversial, it depends on your, your, um, your geographic perspective on that. But that's all part of China um, making sure that it gets a seat at the table. They wanna be part of any decision making and they wanna be an acknowledged stakeholder in the Arctic. And, and they are indeed these days, they've succeeded in that goal. So on to the next slide. So they've, uh, the budget increases, uh, the very significant budget increases into Arctic and Antarctic spending. And for a while, it seemed limitless. And, you know, people that I was in interviewing in China, just they just seemed whatever they wanted, they could, they could get out of the, art, the, uh, the treasury on, on capacity expansion for uh, new icebreakers, new bases, uh, you name it. And there on the right there, um, you can just see the uh, of right of the screen, you can see China's um, ice station in the Arctic. They, they copied the, so the Russians and the US on doing that. And then the left there is China's um, very large base at um, Svalbard. And uh, China has um, a um, an extensive icebreaker program, a development program underway. This one on the, the icebreaker you can see on the left was a Ukrainian cargo uh, ice uh, breaking vessel. China has modernized it a couple of times, but now they've got their own um, ice uh, research vessel. They have another icebreaker. The China Oceanic Administration has another icebreaker, which they sometimes send down to the Antarctic and they're building a nuclear powered one. Finally, they'd planned it in 2014 it was proposed and then they didn't follow through because they're really worried about pushback basically the political risk 
And the fact that they are developing it now shows that China does feel confident that um, that their position and their engagement in the Arctic and Antarctic is accepted now and that they can get away with their furthering their agenda. And it's very, the, the, um, the, all these new icebreakers are built to PLA specifications. The China Oceanic Administration is under PLA, um, is, is, is led by the PLA in a time of conflict. And the new nuclear icebreaker is specifically, or it's been discussed uh, publicly, that it could be used to, if necessary, rescue a, uh, a submarine stuck under the ice um, up in the Arctic. So it's, again, connected to the nuclear uh, deterrence agenda. Um, but there is a change that's been very interesting um, in this year, and it happened before, well before COVID and the budget constraints there will be under COVID. So from about 2015, there has been a, um, a tightening on uh, expenses, on polar expenses. So for example, in the Antarctic, China's fifth base, um, which was, should have been open by now, according to the original schedule, which is in the Ross Sea area, very, not uh, in the flight path of the planes that fly to McMurdo, the US base there, um, that, um, uh, that Ro Ross Sea um, inexpressible island base is still just a, ser a few containers. And that's because the budgets and um, the money is just not there anymore. So this is an interesting development, I think, because, you know, in 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, they spent about 12% of their GDP on the military. And if we add up the budget on the PLA with the uh, what's called the WeWin, the, the stabilization, in other words, political control, social political control budget in China with Belt Road Initiative, I think we're easily going to get to 12 percent of G GDP. So and COVID's only going to make it worse. So that's just a question mark there, but I note, you know, you know, what, what does this mean going forward? Can China afford its ambitious um, um, Arctic and Antarctic expansion. However, to go against my argument, you have here some noises there somewhere. Um, that um, you know, you have country like uh, North Korea that puts a lot of its resources into the military, um, and you know, other services suffer, and that's certainly. Uh, Dr. Brady, if you can go ahead and unmute yourself, we had a unmute. Yep. We had a mute, but thank you. <laughs> Hang on. Go ahead. We I can hear you. We can hear you now. All right. All right now, cool. We're good. Yep. Hi, Ministry of State Security or yeah. PLA or whoever that was. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying the conversation. Okay. Next slide. Anonymous hacker. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, uh, the Arctic at present uh, and the Antarctic at present, they're all expanding. Let's get, oh, well, just one little thing here. That picture on the right there, a um, bit painful for the claimant states in Antarctica. The triangular, if you're used to pictures of the sovereign claims in Antarctica, they're all triangles. They don't match, you know, there's like the penguins and the, the uh, whales don't know about these triangles. They don't necessarily match sort of the biosphere or anything like that. Well, China um, has um, created uh, this area that they, were, they actually humorously called Panda uh, during the International Polar Year. And this is the area of, uh, it's in East Antarctica where China is doing what countries do if you do you think that an area is um, an international space um, and they're, they're naming, they're occupying, um, they are um, discovering, making breakthroughs in discovery. Um, and this is in the, this little uh, triangle, uh, well, substantial triangle within um, Antarctic territory of Australia, uh, which of course the US and other countries, uh, many other countries don't recognise. But the Antarctic Treaty permits countries like Australia and New Zealand, seven countries to make their Antarctic claims and other countries take a different view. And it doesn't permit countries to make new claims in Antarctica. However, um, 
the China internal sources um, in the Chinese sources say that China, like the US and Russia, reserves the right to make a claim in Antarctica. Um, so that's just another interesting example of China's level of ambition and the research they've been doing on what others do in Antarctica. What's good for the goose is good for the gander, as they say. So moving on, because I really want to get to the questions now. Next slide, please. Uh, those are China's, I'm not going to read them out. These are the kind of priorities in the Antarctic and onto the Arctic. We have a similar set of priorities. Next slide. Um, China, as I said, wants to be a stakeholder, seen as a stakeholder in the Arctic. They've achieved that. Internationalizing Arctic governance will be helpful for China because uh, that's more voices that will sort of weaken the influence of the Arctic players. China's position is the Arctic Straits are international straits. Um, it'll be helpful if you want to send submarines through there. And um, they are seeking access to Arctic mineral resources, but they will pay uh, market prices, they say. And people often bring up the comparison with the South China Sea and the Chinese sources saying um, it's, that's different. That's sovereign, Chinese sovereign territory. The Arctic isn't. All right, let's move on because I think we're right at the end now. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. Open to your questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. And we have tons of great questions, as you can imagine. Cool. Um, I think we'll start off with the, uh, we have a question here. Um, so in recent years, China has, has, has tried to build its, its economic relationships, providing financial assistance to, to the different countries and especially uh, to Greenland and Iceland. Um, the question is, so what do you think about the possibility of an independent Greenland uh, and then an, a Greenlandic government becoming friendly uh, to, the, to, uh, to the CCP uh, administration? Um, and as part of that, what are the, the possibility of, of uh, China establishing a, a military base in Greenland? And so yeah, a few questions. That's a great up. question. And you know what? It, um, there's another example that I would lead, uh, like you to think about is um, in the South Pacific, Southwest Pacific is um, uh, French Polynesia and New Caledonia, who also are, um, or territories of France, but they are, um, and New Caledonia is having a second referendum in November on the question of independence. And similar to Greenland, which I have also been, I've been watching and talking with people there, um, officials there um, for about uh, six years now, you know, they, and, and with the, the Danish um, government officials, um, this, it's quite a parallel situ situation there. So um, the French and the Danes, if, the, if the, the Greenlanders and the people in French Polynesia, New Caledonia, if they want independence, and that's what the collective want, then um, okay, we will work with that. Uh, if they don't want that, then if they don't exactly want that, continue on in a um, more autonomy and support. But the question in both um, all those three territories is who's going to continue to subsidise the society? So the China card, and I mean, you might say, why am I talking about the Pacific? But, but this is related to strategic interests and related to the security of my country as well. Because whoever controls those territories, if, some, if a hostile state controls any of those three territories, it will immediately affect our security, just as it was, you know, in Japan, you had Japan in World War II, and um, the Nazis, uh, the Nazi Germany was very active up in the Arctic in World War II also. So who controls these crucial island states is really important to us. And yet it's not a colonial era. So we um what we the the view in new zealand and australia too is yeah we we want those countries to be independent and sovereign so not replacing one colonizer with another and those the, the view um i haven't had the opportunity to visit greenland and talk to a lot of people but i have talked to a few people who are decision makers and the view that i have found there as in new caledonia was that they might have had some illusions about China at some point, but they're not so uh, um, idealistic about what China might offer anymore. So, you know, there's a saying, uh, Mao Zedong had a famous um, term, he, he loved to scoff at others lifting a stone to drop on their own feet. Xi Jinping's foreign policy has done that. He's um, taken off the smiley face mask. And um, so I think that, that um, many countries are a lot more cautious about China. And so I think that um, 
that Greenland, if it was in, became a sovereign state or if it gets more autonomy, will be trying to have a, where it can have a constructive relationship with China and not turn into a neo-colonial state. And I, so I think that what the mentality of that states like the US and my country, even though we're different sides, that we all need to have with these emerging independent states is support them in their independence support them in their sovereignty and find the ways that we can constructively um yeah be part be a part of that and not not try and tell them what to do because that'll push them in another direction but just be supportive and constructive of what their collective decision as a society is for their future thank you and uh, the, the russia china relationships uh has has attracted lots of uh comments and questions uh so and I'll, I'll boil it down to a couple, but the, the, so the first one, uh, you know, what are China's views on Russia's assertion uh, or, or sovereign control in, in, in the way that they view and control the Northern Sea Route? Um, and t it, does China view it in the same way that Russia does? Do they view it more as the U.S. does as an international strait connecting two bodies of water? Yeah, this is one point where Russia, so where China and U.S. have the same position. Okay. And, um, and so Canada you know, for Canada, that's, that's a deal breaker as well. So it's interesting um, where you can, well, I mean, you've got, the US has got its own reasons for that on its position and the reasons that it have, has doesn't suit, the, you know, doesn't mean that you all have common ground with China. Um, but um, yeah, so that's part of the reason why Russia is wary of China, but also, you know, they are, uh, you know, what used to be called the yellow peril, they are afraid of being swamped by Chinese, you know, some populations like in Siberia are afraid of um, being a swamp by Chinese populations. So, and, you know, and you could say, oh, well, is that part of, you know, Chinese government policy? Well, where border control is, um, or lack of border control. Um, and, um, you know, they definitely don't want to have, as I said, to have a dominant China. I, I, there was another interesting, you know, I, I'm not privy to all the briefings that all of you are, but I do read the news and I, I read something that really intrigued me a couple of weeks ago that um, apparently China is also, you know, we're all experiencing China's um, use of uh, our universities to take military technology um, the fact that China was doing that to Russia, I thought was really telling, um, you know, obviously illegally, not because they, that they were, they weren't, they, it was through uh, what seemed like, um, you know, just normal scientific links or other kind of exchanges that, that China had, was directing the Chinese Students and Scholars Association at universities in Russia uh, to, to on this exactly, basically the same kind of stuff that they're doing in Australia and New Zealand and the US and other countries. So that shows me a non-trust relationship. And that shows me that Russia, I mean, Russia signed the Vasana arrangement, China didn't. That's the arrangement on non-proliferation. And um, so, for example, apparently Russia was very annoyed that China turned the Ukraine, um, uh, well, what was a, a Soviet aircraft carrier, actually they claimed that they were buying it to make a casino and then they turned it into the Liaoning. And so I, I reflected on that again as like, so that implies, well, of course, that, that, that um, even though it was Ukraine, it had formerly been Soviet Union, um, I, uh, nuclear, um, sorry, uh, aircraft carrier, that there are, I know it's a very unpopular thing to say, but there, there is some little bit of common ground there with Russia and the US and other states about your concerns on China and the limits on the relations with China. However, of course, the Putin government is, um, you know, really very hard to be at least publicly be seen to cooperate with them at the moment. But you do have so, some of the same strategic concerns about China, I think. Thank you. Yeah, and 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 so I would I would characterize a few of these questions under kind of an economic, a political, and military lens, uh, looking at the China-Russia relationship, and from a political perspective. And this question was actually raised earlier in our Arctic security course. And, and raised again here, but to what extent might China and Russia kind of come together on the political front to, to maybe develop an alternative framework or form to the Arctic Council? Um, what, I, I know I have some views on how, how Russia might view that, but, but would that be of, in China's interest, uh, in Russia's interest in, in 
what's the, the possibility of something like that happening? Well, um, China and Russia have partnered. Um, they're certainly partnered on, they're partnering on um, propaganda, for example, or media cooperation um, and, and many other areas. But I, 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 I I, I think that would what well, you know. I in my book, China, China is a polar great power. I one one chapter is all about um, the question that the U.S. Um, former um, Assistant Secretary uh, raised about whether of state uh, raised about um, whether or not China was a stakeholder in the global order, and um, so I look at. Um, and just broadly, you know, what are, what is China's what are China's intentions going forward? And, and what I found from looking at the Chinese materials and interviews is that um, China will, like other great powers, take advantage of the international system where it suits them, and they'll work with it. Um, and it usually it suits them a lot of the time. You know, UN is fairly effect, ineffective. They've got the veto at the UN um, when they want to. And um, you know, a lot of the time, it'll you know it'll suit China for now. But where it doesn't suit China, they'll set up their parallel structures. So the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is a parallel structure. Belt Road Initiative is a parallel structure. Uh, Seventeen plus one is a parallel structure. Um, so we, uh, uh, but but I I. Um, I think that we again we see that uh, the pattern that um, China doesn't want to get its its wrist slapped. It doesn't want to go too far and get pushed back, and so they're constantly wash, watching as well what they can get away with. So this is the time. As I say this again and again in every talk, we need the united front against the united front. We our countries, this, um, the small and medium states. Um, plus the US need to unite against what China is throwing against us. And it's very difficult at the moment um, to, it's off um, because there are, I mean, the thing that, that bi will bind us is economic, supporting each other economically. And because state, the United States very protectionist under your current government and EU is historically very protectionist, it means that vulnerable countries like mine are, are left uh, dependent on China. And there's many, many other examples. But we can, um, we can collectively keep China uh, being cautious if we are clear about the risk and are united. Because they are relatively weak at the moment. And um, what we want is all the best uh, way and to deal with this China's oh, we, we've got a, some interesting stuff going on now on the screen um, <laughs> um, is um, to collectively get yeah, to be clear about the China threat and to work on the to, to uphold the international rule, rules based order in the multilateral system. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Uh, so another question on uh, kind of along the same lines of the, the China-Russia relationship, uh, kind of a two two part question. One is, you know, we've seen China and Russia cooperate in the South China Sea and do exercises and training and operations together. Yeah. Uh, to what extent might might we see that in the Arctic? Uh, and and the kind of the second piece to that is, and we kind of, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but uh, to what extent, right? Is, to what extent might the the PLIN uh, cooperate, partner with the Russian Navy uh, to do operations uh, in in the Arctic, but, but also might Russia allow China to use their bases to project and you know use as a refueling point or or whatever they need it for? Yeah, and exactly that point was raised by um, a in a Russian military magazine last year. That suggestion we haven't seen it happen yet, but. Um, um, China has been invited to invest in port and infrastructure development in the Russian Arctic. So we're seeing um, some voices exploring that possibility. We have seen the PLA um, dip its toes on the edges of the Arctic 
Ocean, famously, when President Obama went to his first and only visit up to um, the Arctic in 2014, where he was supposed to, well, he went to announce his climate change policy. It was supposed to be a big deal, but the headlines were stolen by five PLA Navy vessels and consisting of three surface vessels, an amphibious vessel and then a supply ship who made a like totally unlikely detour from exercises in Vladivostok. They went all the way up to the Aleutians and they went up through one of those little straits and came down again just to show that they could. And um, a month later, um, they were on the other side of the Arctic Ocean doing goodwill visits to Denmark, Finland and Sweden. And at the time, people speculated that they were going to come home across the Arctic. They didn't, of course, because they couldn't. They don't actually have the capacity to do so as yet. And they've got to, to operate safely in Arctic waters. They need to have accurate bathymetric charts. They've got to have the ability to monitor Arctic atmospheric conditions and to utilize remote sensing to identify the thickness of Arctic ice. They've got to have submarine personnel who are experienced in under ice operations. They've got to have the submarines capable of navigating uh, various choke points that there are like up in the Bering Sea and get there safely and secretly. Uh, they've got to have a Chinese nuclear icebreaker and they've got to have access to friendly seaports and airports in the Arctic. So that's a long list, but I can see that like check checking them off. <laughs> slowly um, and there you can see the um, also how the science is military related as well because people think oh you know they're just doing some weather observations on that ice station yeah that's really helpful for other activities so when I conclude my paper um, that I did for China brief is this big challenge which I think that is broader than just in the Arctic like how to, it's not going to help you to completely, you can't exclude China from the Arctic. They're there now anyway. But, um, it, it, we, you know, if, how can you have, how can you, how can you work out which partnerships with China are benign or mutually beneficial and which of them are force multipliers for the PLA? That's the core question, I think. And, I, and the problem is that, you know, for example, the Alaskan government, when Xi Jinping was visiting with um, President Obama at Annenberg in 2014, he made an, another very unlikely detour. He made a totally unnecessary stop in Alaska and met with your governor. governor. And so you've got local interests like in Tasmania, you know, and this, this is, there's a whole history that China's really taking advantage of. With our market liberal economies where states are told just go and make some money and so Tasmania has been trying to make money as an Antarctic hub so they, they're that one of the hubs for China getting well they're one of their main hubs for getting into Antarctica and you know Alaska will be trying is trying to make money out of their um, their proximity to the Arctic so how do we get the balance right between economic security and particularly economic security of our regions who often ha like the far regions like in the high north in the US or in Canada who have economic difficulties anyway, how do we get the balance right of economic security with national security? And if we're going to tell them, no, you can't partner with China, you can't do all the stuff that they think is benign, but the US government can see the bigger picture. Well, what are you going to do to compensate them from the loss of economic opportunities? So this is a big question. Uh, these are big questions we're looking at. You cannot just compartmentalize it to the military to address it. You're actually going to look at your whole government strategy and approach to your economy. Th thank you. And, and so we have uh, a few more questions. The, um, you know, Secretary Pompeo made headlines uh, during his speech at the Arctic Council uh, where he called out Russia and China. Uh, how has China reacted to this? How, how has the, the CCP, uh, have they been, I guess, to what extent has, has their thinking or behavior or lack thereof changed uh, since since he made those remarks, and uh, and I and I guess the second part question to this is, uh, you know, what can the U.S. do to engage China without increasing uh, the likelihood of uh, of of, uh, of an of an arms race in the sense that where where 
uh, where the U.S. is doing more from a military perspective and China doing more from, from a military perspective. And so establishing those lines of communication. So the, the first one is really China's reaction to Secretary Pompeo's uh, remarks and how, if at all, has that changed uh, their behavior and thinking? Well, you know, I, it was a little while ago that those statements were made. There was probably a comment in Global Times. That's the tabloid. Um, so that's predictable. But um, there wouldn't be any major change to China's strategy. But it's really important the statements were made. And it was very important um, in 2018 that my government in their strategic defense policy statement made the first public statement about military activities in Antarctica that weren't logistic ones, you know, military ones that potentially breached the Antarctic Treaty and what it says about what kind of military activities you can do in Antarctica. It is important to talk publicly about these things. Um, and say, you know, what's regard, you know, what the concerns are. Also, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, he also raised concerns about uh, in 2019 uh, about China's increased presence in the in the Arctic. So, yeah, public comments are very, very important, and they will help to um, not just curb China, but they'll also help to inform people um, in our respective countries and particularly in the, um, those who engage in the Arctic and Antarctic and might be engaging with China. We need to educate our population about national security risk at the moment and, and, um, be really clear, not alarm us, just be really clear. So, um, you know, the more specific, the, the better, I think, that about, um, what's going on. I, I you know, I was born in the, uh, the middle, mid mid Cold War era baby, and I now know from teaching my students how uh, the difference of my education and theirs. We in our newspapers and and, and you know and, and broadly in our society, we knew a lot about the um, the Eastern Bloc, how it worked, what its policies were, what agenda was, what the risk was. Um, you know, we you know I grew up protesting against and, uh, nuclear weapons. You know, my gov my country was really really worried about um, the threat of nuclear war. And so we were quite informed about um, security risks in my generation. And I think people are not really well informed. And, th and that has a negative impact on our overall security because China's engaging in this China Inc. strategy in Arctic affairs as well as in Antarctic affairs and, and more broadly than that. So individual citizens can potentially be engaging in activities that are against our national interests. Um, and uh, sorry, Walter, can you remind me the next part of the question? Yeah, I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that question because uh, it ties in to probably one of our last questions. And I'll, we'll transition here now to uh, basically two questions kind of lumped in together. Uh, one is, not, is it's really along the themes of, of gaining uh, access and influence and, and gaining a foothold in the region. Uh, so you mentioned science. You know, to what extent uh, does China use science to, to do exactly that, to, to gain a foothold and, and to parlay that into uh, other areas, whether that's economically uh, or along the military front. And then as part of that, you know, to what extent, you mentioned the vulnerable and you mentioned citizens, but quite often the indigenous peoples are often left out of the conversation. Um, and to me, that seems like a vulnerable community. So can you talk to that and to what extent China might, you know, try to engage or connect with them as a means to gain access and influence in the region. Yeah, the um, so China targets individual Arctic governments, and it also targets the indigenous groups in the Arctic. That's a very specific strategy, and um, it's part of um, you know what um, the US would call political warfare or gray zone. It's what the CCP would call United Front work. And um, so that's part of what I'm saying. It's why it's good to have clear messaging from our governments and um, as well as, you know, really, particularly the political leaders, I think, because if um, the media, starts, you know, if a media story comes out, people might say, oh, you know, that's some alarmist journalist or that's some alarmist academic. But when our political leaders make um, factual, um, well-reasoned statements about, matters of concern, then um, that, that's a very clear signal. And um, so how to, 
you know, acknowledge the the autonomy of indigenous peoples in in the Arctic, which are and they're they're obviously their connections across border, um, across borders, at the same time as um, warn them or to prepare them to upskill them of the risks, or potential risks that could be in some of those engagements. Again, I think that's through um, factual public conversations. And this was, um, and it's putting good information, clear information in the public domain. You know, I, I, because I studied the Cold, Cold War era um, information campaign so much in the past, and I, I study them critically when the, in the past, I understand them better now, um, because, you know, they did have, some people got, I mean, McCarthy is there, just as in the US as in New Zealand, some people got blacklisted, uh, you know, completely, uh, it was kind of, uh, and it was a very broad brush, um, often. But there were actually were specific concerns about certain individuals. Um, but there was this very targeted campaign from within the Five Eyes countries to to provide factual information about the Eastern Bloc to the media, and that went on for decades. And so we um, should replicate that um, with the factual information side of things. I, I think. And um, I see that there's, there is some really great research coming out of the US now on many think tanks on, on lots of, you know, really granular aspects to political interference. And you need to do that when it comes to China and the Arctic too. And the hard thing, and the thing that really makes me very, very cross actually, is that a lot of people who talk about China and the Arctic don't speak Chinese. And if you do not, and they might be Arctic specialists, and that specialist, that, that expertise is, is great. You know, I value that. I say, you know, we've all got a piece of the puzzle. So we, I, you know, I'll draw on that when I'm trying to come up with understand what's going on more broadly. But if you don't, if you cannot access the Chinese language materials and read what you're not supposed to read, what read what's not meant for foreign eyes, then you really don't know what's going on in China. You cannot take the white paper on the Arctic and other public statements like that as the complete picture. And I, China is a pole of great powers based on 10 years of reading Chinese language um, materials and 10 years of interviews as well. I went back many times to China, as well as doing interviews outside China and, and drawing on the secondary studies. So I'd encourage this, but the challenge is, of course, you know, it's a big learning curve to be, a, you've got to be a Chinese language speaker, as well as know about the CCP party state system and how all that works and then add on the arctic knowledge so teamwork i think is the way to go is the, the speed speedy way to go is combine expertise probably is the way to go but i have noted quite a few pronouncements by u.s um leaders in the last two years on arctic and Antar well antarctic affairs actually where there's been a few little uh errors made and um, on little details like whether the Antarctic Treaty ends in 2048 and stuff like that. So it's really important that messaging, the messaging that is, is accurate. Um, and I think, as I said, as I began by saying, attention has been on um, you know, the Middle East and other areas of the world. And the US and its allies, and NATO in particular, need to do the due diligence to and, and engage with the political issues of the Arctic and Antarctic again, and, and make that investment on, ongoing. Um, because China prioritizes it, and China has a global foreign policy. And so in order to defend its interests in the US, the US has to pay attention to what China is paying attention to. Well, yeah, and thank you for that. And, and a quick follow up, and, and this goes to I think what our last question. Um, it looks like we're running running short on time, and that's you know we talked a lot about competition and potential conflict, um, but let's talk a little cooperation. Well, we certainly hit on cooperation between China and Russia, uh, but to what extent might policymakers think about ways to extend an olive branch to China and the Arctic? Mm -hmm. uh, what are some potential areas of cooperation? I mean, given your background and, and expertise and, and and the many folks that you've engaged with, uh, what do you think are some ripe areas for cooperation? Looking across the political, military, economic, you know, social, scientific perspective. Yeah, you asked me that earlier and I, I dodged it um, because I've been, 
I have been a bit critical of what I've seen going on, actually, because I think it's not clear eyed enough. That's been my fear anyway, my fear that the engagement was not very, was perhaps not clear eyed and it was part of that mindset that there was um, that I observed when I started doing my research that people thought, oh, you know, it's all sorted. We've you know, we've got the Arctic Council, we've got the Antarctic Treaty and the various other instruments of it. Um, everything's fine. Um, in fact, I remember um, giving a talk in Washington, D.C. in 2009 and a retired U.S. State Department Antarctic, uh, because they tend to stay in the area for a while, he, um, you know, he publicly called me alarmist. I'm not alarmist. I would love to be wrong on China and the CCP. I, would, I was hoping I'd be wrong that we're in a long 1930s and now we're probably about 1942. Um, I don't think I'm wrong. And, um, and this, this book, it's based on what China says, what the CCP says. So the problem was that the people who the US has, have um, given the authority to engage in polar affairs in the State Department, is they're not China specialists, they're international law specialists. And in the Pentagon, I mean, I visited the Pentagon last year and gave a, a talk. Um, you haven't, you know, you're, busy, you're just doing so many things and you just don't have your because you haven't, it hasn't been regarded as a priority. You haven't got your, you haven't got your own China, uh, Arctic and Antarctic military uh, issues specialists, like you probably have for Middle East, you'll have all the, you know, people with specific knowledge. Um, and then there's just the problem anyway, is that people are supposed to be generalists and they get moved around and you never get time to do proper research and all of that. But that's why, that's what academics are for. Um, and, but then of course, you know, as I've observed in the US system, you know, there's no incentive for academics to do this kind of policy relevant research. The political scientists are pushed to do stuff on methods and models and, you know, quite stuff that's really abstract for governments. But, you know, academics will go where the money is. So if, the, if anything can go through in this talk, Walter, encourage some uh, dedicated funding for researchers, academics who do have the time and the expertise, who have got the language skills, the Chinese language skills, and who can partner with an Arctic specialist to make sure they get the details right, um, to do some research um, that will be useful to your government, particularly, you know, on the military side of things. Because, you know, I, I can, I, I, the, I, the, the stuff that I've done is, um, not particular to the US interests and I don't have access to all the information about what the concerns of the US and what the capacity of the US is. So I do really think the US needs to do its own research, but you've got to do eyes wide open research. So to come back to your question about engagement and cooperation, we're in a, I don't think we're really much in a cooperation phase right now. But I understand, you know, even in the Cold War, they still were talking to each other, right? And they had phone lines and things like that. So as long as the cooperation is clear eyed and not naive cooperation, um, I support it. And also, you should always know, of course, that, you know, China's not a monolith, that um, we've been, you know, polar officials are a lot of the people that, who work on polar policy, for example, they're environmentalists too. But the national script is all about accessing the resources so you those personal engagements are really important for the long term you know you might not get an outcome immediately but we do still need to engage and know that individuals they might have they might be saying what the government asks them to say but they have their own views as well so you taking the long view engagement even in this difficult um, time is has value and um keep talking has value but it must be eyes wide open and understanding these kind of um, uh, what were non-transparent agenda uh, about China's uh, military interests that, um, that I've outlined today. And th so thank you so much for, for uh, sharing your, your thoughts and your time with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you're interested in viewing this, uh, this video, uh, we will have it uh, posted to our Naval War College YouTube page uh, here in the next couple of days. And um, so we encourage you to take a look if you'd like. Uh, I apologize for not getting to all the questions, but we, we, we try to reach and, and combine as many as possible. Um, and so again, thank you very much, uh, Anne-Marie, for, for joining us. Thank you uh, to each of you for, for joining us and taking the time out of your day. Uh, and, um, and, uh, 
so long from uh, Newport, Rhode Island. <laughs> Cool. And yeah, thank you for the privilege of um, sharing my ideas with you and um, yeah, being allowed to monopolize the conversation. I, I want to take, I hope the chat doesn't disappear because I really want to read through it all and, um, and see what everyone else is thinking. Yeah, yeah, we'll <laughs> save it for you. Great. Yeah, okay. it's been great talking to all of you and I hope to meet uh, more of you in person in future when, the, when, when this is all over, whenever, if it ever is going to be over. Who knows? Absolutely. All right. Bye for now. Take care.